You are watching Web of Faith 2.1 and a half Presented by Father John Tregilio and Father Kenneth Briganti We are happy you will be joining us And now, without further ado Father Kenneth Briganti and Father John Tregilio Hello and welcome to another edition of Web of Faith 2.1 and a half it's a special edition that we're doing in the time of quarantine. It's based on our regular show, uh, Web of Faith 2.0, which airs on EWTN, 11 p.m. Saturday, Eastern Standard Time. My name is Father Kenneth Brigenti, and I am the pastor here at St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi in Flemington, New Jersey. And I'm joined by my extinguished, no, I mean my distinguished <laughs> friend, yeah, distinguished. Father yeah. John Tregilio. <laughs> yeah, because I turned 58 yesterday. I'm extinguished now. <laughs> yes, I'm... Uh, Priest of the Diocese of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Director of Pastoral Formation at Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And just a reminder, you can email your questions in, and we will put that email up on there. You do not have to do it on Facebook. You can go right to the email address, which is the parish secretary, and then in turn, she will then send them over to us here at the, at the rectory. So remember, uh, you can email your questions if they're theological, uh, liturgical, moral, uh, doctrinal, and uh, anything with code of canon law, we'd be happy to answer them on air, on the air for you. So again, uh, uh, to, this is a special edition. Uh, as long as we're quarantined, Monday through Friday, you'll be seeing us. And we thank our producer and director and technician, Father Matthew Marinelli. And cameraman. And cameraman, <laughs> who brings this to you. Uh, and yesterday, make sure you watch yesterday's uh, edition uh, because he did a lot of picture work, because we talked a lot about uh, different types of vestments and vessels and things like that. And so he spent really the whole afternoon in getting that all ready for you. So I think you'll enjoy that. I was quite impressed, Father. Very, very, good. very yes, impressed. Yeah. And, um, and this way you could see what we were talking about by having a visual. Anyways, uh, a very serious question came to me uh, this morning, not really part of the, uh, the question and answers that we were getting. It was rather a, a question to me. Uh, but I am going to, I think we're going to discuss this online anyways. It's from a hospital chaplain. And the question goes like this. I am a hospital chaplain at, at a major hospital. The hospital is now over half full of COVID positive patients. Hundreds of cases and more are coming in every day. Uh, the doctors and nurses are not letting anyone in the room, not even husbands or wives of the dying. I've been called several times. He's the chaplain, by the way. And in, uh, all the cases, the patients was sedated, and when I arrived, and showing no signs of conscious activity. Some hospital rooms have glass doors so that you can see inside. Others do not. Needless to say, I cannot administer the last rites from the hallway. Nevertheless, people are still calling for a priest and expect a priest to do something. Today, the crying wife and daughter of the patient were in the hallway. Because of that, a nurse went into the room put the patient on the intercom so that he could hear what we were saying in the hallway. He was sedated, but sometimes sedated people can still understand what is being said. His wife spoke to him, then his wife handed me the intercom. I introduced myself as always, and then told him to be sorry for any sins he'd committed that might be on his conscience, and to commend himself to our Lord's mercy. I gave him absolution through the glass door, as in confession, and the apostolic pardon. Then I said the Our Father with his wife and daughter and a few additional prayers. Does this seem like a good practice to you for now, given the current conditions? Just wanted to get a second opinion. Thanks. Yes, this is a very good solution. And remember, the intercom is not like a phone, because, of course, if there was a phone call, we would definitely not be permitted to do um, the absolution or the apostolic pardon uh, through the um, through the phone waves uh, or the uh, phone lines, I should say. But this is an intercom, so it's like the old-fashioned confessionals. Uh, and the they would have these um, little um, they look like phones. You would pick it up for the hearing impaired, and you would be able to listen to Father on the other side, who would talk into it, and so. Uh, it's, it wasn't a phone, but rather it was just to augment his voice and your voice would come across uh, clearly. So in, it is the same situation, 
uh, in just the technical part of the question, that would be um, true. And yes, even um, sedated people, it's true. The last thing that really goes in a person who's in conscience, they say, is the hearing. So uh, go I, all by all means. But even if the person was unconscious, uh, you can still give what we call conditional absolution and the apostolic pardon and the final blessing. Uh, that would be fine. Um, remember, the absolution is more important even than in the anointing of the sick. Uh, so uh, even though he couldn't give the anointing of the sick because of the uh, the barrier and they were not permitted in the um, the absolution is is uh, suffices and is in this case most important. Yes, and uh, obviously it's so important too that the person themselves uh, needs to be sorry for their sin. So the the, the nice part is when you're making a normal auricular confession is that the very per the fact that they're telling you their sins is an indication that they're sorry. When they're unable to speak, that's why his father Brigenti said, you know, it's conditional. Because if they're not sorry for their sins, then that absolution has no, no effect whatsoever. But, uh, you know, that's why you, you give a conditional absolution uh, to the person. And um, if they're awake, but they can't speak, uh, I know uh, this happened to me once when I had to visit someone who was in isolation, which it, back then we didn't that's have right, the because you were a chaplain COVID. in the yes. hospital yourself. And... Uh, the person was in isolation, and uh, they couldn't speak, but I had was able to, through the uh, intercom system, and, it, and it's a closed system, which is so important. Closed system means that intercom only goes to that room and, and nowhere else, which is the typical case. But I would ask uh, the priest to make sure that he finds that out from the nurse. Anyway, the person was in there, and uh, they wrote on a piece of paper uh, their, their, their mortal sins, held it up to the window, and it was just me there. And I, I saw that, and, and I asked them, are you sorry for these sins? And they, they shook their head yes, and so that was uh, sufficient. Now, I also made sure that paper was destroyed because, God forbid, if that paper were left behind or thrown in the trash and someone found it, the, the seal of the confession could, could be in jeopardy. So uh, I said to the person, make sure that is completely destroyed and uh, they did it. I, I watched them, okay? Um, they obviously couldn't set on fire because they had oxygen in there. Uh, but they destroyed in such a way, they tore it into a thousand pieces and then uh, poured some uh, uh, alcohol on it and, uh, and all the ink, you know, smudged all over the place. So there's no way anybody could ever figure out what was on there. Um, but uh, there's instances where somebody, or when someone comes to confession normally and can't speak, um, I've had a case where I didn't know sign language, uh, but I had the person write uh, on a piece of paper, and I said, make sure this is burned, all right? Because, right. uh, again, I don't want to violate the seal directly or or indirectly. But uh, as you said, the, the, the absolution is the most important part. If you're able to do that, um, you know, and, by all means. And we also, um, I remember being a pastor of a previous parish, we had a special needs program so these are uh, different uh, youngsters that would come in with different uh, disabilities. And one of the kids came in, and it was only able to communicate by typing and machines mm, and things yeah. like that, or by me asking questions, and then they would type Y for yes and N for no or what have you. And that's the way we had to go about it because their, their, their disability was, was so impaired. Not mentally. They were mentally fine. But they had a, a certain impairment, uh, and so we tried to adapt it to the best of their ability, so that we gave them uh, the sacraments. So they were these were a lot of parishes do have these programs called special needs, and I was very proud of, of St. Anne's in Raritan that had this, and um, it was one teacher per student. And then when we came over for confession, uh, we went into a classroom and we made it. Um, the teacher brought the, the student in and then make sure the student was very comfortable. Uh, I would come over a few weeks ahead of time for like three or four times so that they get to know me a little bit and they weren't afraid to come into confession and then sort of to um, visit their classroom and all that. And that seemed to work out very well. So I was there for nine years and we did that program as long as I've been there. Uh, it existed before I was there, but um, but I think uh, in similar way, the communication aspect was impaired, like uh, Father was mentioning about this COVID-19 uh, patient is. But, but yet God's grace and sacrament in the sacrament can still work 
uh, in, in these hard times. So we want to th uh, thank Father, the chaplain, uh, who puts his life out, just like all of the other emergency people, doctors and nurses and, and what have you. Uh, he puts his life out every day by going into that hospital. And all the other chaplains that uh, work throughout uh, our country, uh, we want to give a big shout out to them uh, for uh, all their, their, their work that they do in this. And, and of course, we want to pray for them too. And everybody out there should pray for the priests that are working in these special uh, cases uh, and scenarios because they really are putting their, their lives on the, on the line there for that. So thank you for that question. Very good. And um, and now we, we we can continue on to our regular questions that okay. we have. Let's see here. So this one's for you, Father. Uh-oh. Uh, dear Father John, as always, I enjoy your show. You bring a certain air of uh, uh, to it, and I thank you for <laughs> all. Air, <yeah. laughs> I thank you for sharing uh, all that your knowledge that you have uh, with us. So my question is, Father, why does the priest put a few drops of water in the chalice at Mass? Thank you, Steve. Well, Steve, uh, you're very observant uh, because that it goes by so quickly. Many people don't even <clears throat> notice that it happens. Um, the priest must put a drop of water in the chalice, uh, not for validity, but for lyseity, that it's, it's illicit Mass. If he, for any reason, forgot or didn't do it intentionally, it would still be valid, but it would be illicit. And the reason why he does that, uh, the prayer that he says reminds us of, of the hypostatic union, uh, that Jesus is a true God and true man. He has a full human nature and a full divine nature. And so, so he says, so the mystery is water and wine. We become the share in divinity of Christ, call himself the share in our humanity. So the one drop, okay, uh, represents humanity uh, being um, united with Jesus' divinity. But it, it's, it's, it's an analogy, okay? Uh, the problem is that you can't use it as a as a theological explanation because that one drop of water gets absorbed into the wine. And that's a heresy that the church doesn't want people to believe that Jesus' humanity got so assumed into his divinity. There was a heresy for that. What was that? Yes. Um, well, there's a couple, a couple of versions, monophysism um, and monothelitism, uh, where his natures were, uh, the human nature got absorbed. Uh, into his now, docetism is the heresy that Jesus only appeared to be human, like a shell, like invasion right. of the body snatchers. But and Arianism, Arianism is where they said Jesus was uh, human no. and then was adopted by God, so that he is uh, human but not truly divine. Okay, uh, sort so, of like a demigod. So yeah, almost like Hercules, okay, yeah. or Mister Spock or something like that. These were all early heresies. Early heresies, and, and fact that uh, a, a major councils. Uh, one was the Nicene uh, uh, Constantinople Council that had to be uh, called, in which we have the creed that we pray every Sunday at Mass to fight against specifically that it was Arianism. That was uh, the first there. one, yes. Yeah, and um, so all these heresies existed. Uh, now we're seeing them rehashed, though, <laughs> uh, under different titles. We had them in our like, when we were in the seminary. They were New really age rehashed. is really old age. It's really Gnosticism of the third century, you know, fourth century. So, you know, so you're seeing them rehashed, and uh, and and uh, you know, certain uh, liberal theologians. You know, I, I like to read the Catholic Herald. It's a it's a, it's a um, Catholic newspaper printed in England, and it gives you the heretic of the week. And it's, first of all, it's a little humorous that a Catholic newspaper does that, but you learn so much about theology for that way, because mm -hmm. it tells you where this person is wrong and why he's yes. wrong and, uh, and all that. So all these early heresies were, you know, um, um, fought, uh, and some of them were even fought by the, the emperor would get involved and the, the, the poor Orthodox Catholic bishops, Orthodox meaning right thinking Catholic bishops would have to be in exile. And, and a lot of battles were fought on, on these, uh, on these grounds, but truth, of course, finally won out and, um, and vindicated. Um, but, um, I interjected to you. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. That's okay. Um, the one last thing I wanted to point out was, that it only has, it could only be a few drops of water, uh, because if you put too much water, if you put more than fifty-one percent water in there, then it's no longer wine, and it has to be wine in order for the priest to consecrate it. So, for it to be a valid uh, matter for the sacrament, you can't have that much water in there. That's why they only the rubrics say a drop or two. Now, 
uh, when Father Brigenti, I would go on retreat up to Arnold Hall in, in Massachusetts, run by Opus Dei. They have this, what we call the Opus Dei spoon. <laughs> it's this little tiny spoon uh, that I think actually was used for like... Uh, There's a specific name which doesn't come to mind, yes. but... Scruple, Scruple spoon, spoon, that's there, it. There, Thank there, you, Father our, Matthew. Our cameraman is, is big yeah. and our producer. Scruple spoon. Because right. that guarantees you only put a drop, because that, that little spoon can only contain a, a, a drop. So that was one way. Now, obviously, priests, you know, don't have that, and they drop, they pour a few drops in there. But uh, tr as close to one or two is, is I would say, be very, uh, is what the, the norm would be. Some priests add a little bit more because maybe the, the, the wine uh, upsets their stomach or any number of other things. But, you, but he has to be careful that he does not go over that 50% that, that mark because uh, then it would be invalid matter. So... Uh, keep it to a, a drop or two, but some priests in the in the seventies and eighties weren't doing it at all, or they were omitting the the washing of the fingers. That doesn't affect the validity, but it would affect the lyseity of the mass. Yeah, um, as we said once before in an earlier episode, you know, there's the, these prints on in the in the sacrament or the missal, I should say, that tells you what to do. It's called rubrics because it's written in red. And we're supposed to do what the rubrics tell us to do. And then in the black print is we're supposed to say the black, okay? And not divert from there and make up things. Um, so um, do the red and say the black. That's a simple formula. And if every priest out there does that, uh, the mass would be very dignified and beautiful. So, um, and it's the, really the least we can do. We're supposed to, as celebrants, take ourselves out of it so that we're not a distraction at Mass, but rather Christ, who is the priest and victim, shines through us. So that's why the rubrics of the Mass help us to do that. Uh, and um, and so one of the rubrics, of course, is just a drop of water. Now, by chance, an extra drop gets in there. It's fine. Uh, that's why the, uh, Father Matthew uh, reminded us the scruple spoon, uh, because it would be, uh, it would be, I would say, um, you know, scrupulous if we, you know, worry too much about like a double drop got in there. It's, as Father mentioned, if it was majority going into the water. So you see like one or two drops by mistake comes out. Because some, for some reason, when you're putting that one drop of water in some, at the first time, an extra one sometimes usually comes out too. And that's fine. Uh, so, uh, so not to worry about that. It didn't change anything of the lyseity of the Mass or anything. Well, thank you. That was very good. Okay, we have one for you now. Okay. Father Brigenti, love your show, love your parish. My question is, why did Pope Benedict XVI change the words of the Mass? And this is from Stanley. Well, dear Stanley, I, I think what you're referring to is the revised Roman Missal, uh, which we were referring to in the last question, which came out in 2012. And uh, from time to time, uh, the um, especially after the Second Vatican Council, before the Second Vatican Council, very little changed in the, the holy sacrifice of the mass, the ritual, uh, from um, even before the Council of Trent. It, it, there was the uh, the it was standard. Uh, the, the liturgy then became standardized under the Council of Trent, but it was similar uh, before. But uh, Trent sort of standardized it, and that took place in around the 1560s. Okay, the the late later part of the 16th century, and pretty much it stayed the same. Uh, little things were added here and there. Uh, John the Twenty Third is recently in 1962 added the word uh, added uh, Saint Joseph to the Roman canon. That's the f uh, in post Vatican II. That's the first long Eucharistic prayer that that we uh, have the option of saying, which is the one that's pretty much a, a very of ancient uh, 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 text and quality. Uh, and so. Um, and has prestige and prest and um, very pristine in, in its um, in its um, setup and all that. And anyways, that uh, he added Saint Joseph to it. So uh, from time to time, the Pope, being the official liturgist, can do these things or have uh, the office of liturgy change a few things here and there, and he can sign off on that. Uh, as long as the words of consecration and institution remain the same, you know, um, some of the other rituals like adding the calendar of saints, uh, that's changed uh, um, from time to time because as the canonization of saints came about, uh, they had to add them and their masses to the Roman Missal. So from 1910 
you know, to 2020, we've had quite a few beatifications and canonizations, and those could be added to the Roman Missal. Now, Pope Benedict XVI, what he tried to do is try to have a more authentic translation from the Latin. Uh, in 1969, the very first translation of the Mass was sort of like a summary, uh, the, the, um, the, what we call the collix or the, the opening prayer, uh, the prayer before over the, the gifts, uh, the a prayer after communion, even the prefaces, were written in a summary form of what the Latin was saying uh, because translating from the Latin into the English was... Um, uh, didn't translate well sometimes uh, in the modern languages, and so it would. So they tried to then uh, had uh, made it more contemporary. But what happened was the scriptural aspect of these prayers were lost, and some of the beautiful adjectives in these prayers uh, were also lost. So um, the later part of the, um, uh, um, the uh, or should I say, the early part of the twenty first century. Uh, there was a commission to go over to to revise. I think it was revised in 1985, I should say, under John Paul II. And now again, uh, it was revised under Benedict XVI. When it was 1969 and 1985, it was called a sacramentary. Uh, and now we call it what it was called before the Roman Missal. Okay. Um, and um, so in, in the Roman Missal uh, the, of, that we have today, is a more authentic translation from the Latin. And the first you know, year or so, you, know, you really had to, the pre, as the priest, had to really prepare that prayer because you would want it, the default was to go back to the other translation. And sometimes it was incongruous, so you really had to spend the time to where you would put the accent or the, or the pause in there so that the prayer would make sense. Um, but now that that's happening, could see that it's a richer and fuller meaning and very and more scriptural. Did you want to maybe talk the difference between the sacramentary and the missal itself? You know, yes, we're showing our age at this point because uh, Father uh, Marinelli, he's only uh, uh, he's been using the Roman missal, which is the third typical edition, as Father Briganti uh, mentioned. Uh, it was issued the Roman, I mean, the Latin edition was issued under two thousand and and two under Pope John Paul uh, the Great. And then he passed away, and it was Pope Benedict then who issued the uh, English edition that we have now, the third it took typical. Twelve years for yeah, the, the Vox Clara Commission, yeah. ISIL, and, and this, this was standard for all the English-speaking yes, countries. Yes, and it's all united now because at one time some of them were a little bit different. So all the English-speaking countries now have the same English translation, and uh, it's similar to what they do in translating the, the Bible. There's a dynamic. Uh, uh, equivalence where um, you know they use sort of like um, like when we were doing Latin in, in the seminary, you know it was um, an approximation. You used a lot of uh, you know loose translations, but the uh, but formal, something got lost in the translation. Yes, and yeah. and there the was beauty and the meaning, and not only that, but the precision. So the formal correspondence is now uh, the the, um, the the goal of the translator. So exactly what the Latin says is what we now have in the English. So, for instance, the word cup, that was in, in the older English translation, but they went to the more ancient and more correct translation of colleagues in Latin as chalice. And let's not forget promultus. Promultus, yes, because promultus means for many. And when the uh, new translation of the, of the Mass came out, after the Second Vatican Council, uh, they had translated for all men. And I remember just before we were ordained priests, they changed that to for all. And theologically, it was accurate because Jesus did come to die for all men's sins, and that included men and women. But biblically and technically, the phrase was for many because it goes in the scripture says for the many which, again, the universal salvific will of God, and as uh, we mentioned in a previous episode, St. Augustine made it clear that God gives everyone sufficient grace, so it's not that just is for a select few, but if you understand promultus for the many in its proper context, and the idea, the thinking was that by now, in the 2013, uh, when this was being issued uh, formally and being implemented, it now made complete sense to people in the pew, just like consubstantial, 
okay, that we say in the creed, the former one was one in being, which was acceptable, but if you ask the average person in the pew, what does one in being mean? Right. I was afraid that a lot of them would get more confused of, of, a, of a not completely orthodox with a small o uh, doctrine, whereas consubstantial, okay, uh, Jesus is consubstantial with the Father. Okay. It's the same substance, not similar, because that was the big uh, heresy, uh, homoousios, homoousios. Uh, the heretic uh, Arius was trying to say that Jesus was similar as the Son to the Father, and the Council of Nicaea said, no, it's one and the same substance, because all three persons of the Trinity share the same intellect and will, same divine nature, not similar. But I think you just gave a very good argument why we keep things in Latin, and maybe uh, because Latin doesn't change, whereas the vernacular languages, they evolve. You know, that's why at one time before the Vatican Council we used Holy Ghost. Now it's Holy Spirit because ghost bring, uh, brings... I think a, a Casper. <laughs> Casper, the friendly <laughs> ghost, right. Uh, but brings different ideas. But in the German, it's Geist, okay? Yes. And that's where it's, uh, you know... We have a lot of dramatic influence in, in the English language, but go uh, so so we don't say the Holy Ghost anymore. We say not that it's wrong. You could still say the Holy Ghost, and a lot of the old prayer books will have that. But the fact that we are now using Holy Spirit is because the English language then changes and the connotations change, whereas in the Latin it doesn't. And the other thing too about another argument for Latin, I would say, is that no matter where you go throughout the world, if if you are an English-speaking person in Italy or an English-speaking person in in, um, in Poland or what have you, and if the Mass is celebrated in Latin, you know, you're able at one time to respond to all the prayers, and really you're, you're experiencing the universal church. Now, obviously, the readings and things of that nature could be done in the vernacular because then you can understand them and hear them in there. But with the old prayer books, you would have the Latin on one side, the English on the other. <laughs> It was a it was a real universality of the church when we had that. So I think your argument right there is the precision of the Latin. Is so oh yes, and, and going back to the creed, we went from um, being born of the Virgin Mary to being incarnate of the right. Virgin Mary because Mary it's more just theological. Which yes, Mary just didn't give birth to Jesus; she gave him his flesh, right. so that he received his humanity from his mother. Because obviously today, you know, we because you know we have the where some people have these in vitro fertilizations and they have donor eggs where it's now possible for, you know, it's and By the way, these are all possible. good questions to ask in, these moral questions. Yes. So uh, remember them to write those in if you'd like to, for us to give you more of the theological explanation on, on these moral aspects that Father just talked about uh, that are uh, just because that we have the ability through science to do these things doesn't make it uh, uh, theologically correct to do them, right? Like, we have the ability to to blow up the whole world through, through the atom bomb. Does that give us morally the reason to do so? Okay, because but we have the knowledge to do. So even science and the medical that have developed so many things, but theological or uh, morally, do we have the right to do some of the things? So these are good questions for you, uh, the viewer, if you would like us to answer on um, on uh, the show, we'd be happy to do so. Now. Unfortunately, we're coming to the conclusion of another episode. No. Time goes by so fast. Uh, even in, Temp war Tempest even in quarantine. Tempest Someone, Fuji, I, I, I Father. Was, Tempest Fuji. I, I was, I was uh, reading um, uh, a commentary on Facebook, and they have a new day of the week now. It's What's called that? Blur's Day. Blur's Day. Blur's Day, yes. Because every day is like Groundhog Day. You get up, it's the same thing. Every day, Blur's Day. I thought that was a pretty good, uh, yeah, good analogy. I like that. I like that. Anyways, uh, uh, we hope you enjoyed another uh, this episode and tune in again. And remember, we really do appreciate you uh, supporting your parishes. Uh, uh, for those who are not uh, members of St. Magdalene's, whatever parish you're in, but especially those who are parishioners here at St. Magdalene's, we thank you for s continuing your financial support. Uh, and again, you can. Leave it with the uh, with the secretary between ten and one, or in the church in the in the little offertory basket on the baptismal font. Mail them in, or go online and you can um, electronically start giving, uh, and it's an easy way to 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 do that. Or even texting. However you do, uh, thank you for your continued support of our parish, uh, so that we can ensure we're we're approaching our 175th anniversary, 
and we want to ensure the future generation to be a, another 175 years here. We can only do that by your sacrificial offertory. So, and don't forget to mention mass. Mass every day, eight o'clock, and uh, Holy Week will be a little bit different. Um, we'll we'll tell you about that next week, and um, but uh, and also we have adoration every day. So. Uh, our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you until we see you next time. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Web of Faith 2.1 and a half. Please join us again tomorrow at 5 p.m. as Father John Tregilio and Father Kenneth Briganti answer more of your questions on Catholicism. Until then, God bless you, and God love you.